Do you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? Quiet, numbskulls. I'm broadcasting. Can we get serious now? One thing that did happen during the 60s was some music of an unusual or experimental nature did get recorded and did get released. Now look at who the executives were in those companies at those times. Not hip young guys. These were cigar chomping old guys who looked at the product that came and said, I don't know. Who knows what it is? Record it. Stick it out of it. sells. all right. We were better off with those guys than we are now with the supposedly hip young executives who are making the decisions of what people should see and hear in the marketplace. Success in the music business begins with a dream, a vision. This podcast will give you, the listener, the insight and tools to turn that vision into a reality. Meet the industry professionals who work day by day behind the scenes, helping to make those dreams come true. Welcome to the business side of music. In the studio with us today, this guy, if, if, first of all, if I read his bio... <laughs> we would we would spend the whole time just listening to my voice. We're not going to do that. But this gentleman has been everywhere and has played with everybody. Uh, before the show, we were talking about, I remember him from the Sky Kings day, but it's good to have him in the studio. John Cowan's with us. Welcome. Thank you, Bob. Thanks for having me. You have accomplished a lot in your career, Newgrass Revival. You've played with Sam Bush, Bella Fleck, I guess. Pat Flynn, Curtis Furch, Courtney Johnson. Yeah. Those are all the members. Let's go back to the very beginning. How did you get started in all this? In the music business? Yeah. Um, well, I sang in church. My parents were both really very active in the, um, the church. My dad was a singer. He sang in choir, and he also had barbershop quartet that he was involved in. And so there was always music in the home, and he had a he had a beautiful voice, uh, kind of a he really loved Bing Crosby and Frank Sinatra and Andy Williams, people like that. So that was kind of what he was. I think that's kind of the what he molded his own singing from. Uh, but he never sang for a living. He just totally did it amateurly speaking. Uh, he did it for level. the love of it. Yeah. So that was just a part of my life, and I started singing in the choir really young, like maybe six, and I really liked it. But I didn't know if I could sing or not. I really didn't. And then I started playing. Uh, I joined a little... I was walking down the street in my neighborhood one day in Louisville, Kentucky. I was 14, a sophomore, I believe, either freshman or sophomore. There was a guy sitting on his front porch playing an electric guitar. Wow. He was my age. Um, school hadn't started. I moved in the summer. So we hadn't realized that, you know, we were going to not only the same age, but we we're going to be going to the same school together. And um, he played guitar. I didn't play anything at that time. And then there, we discovered another guy in, on the other side of the neighborhood played drums. So we started a little band and I started playing bass on the guitar because I didn't have a bass. My parents had bought me an electric guitar, and I was taking lessons. So I just started playing the bass parts on the guitar. And then um, when my dad realized I was pretty serious about it, he went and took me to a pawn shop and bought me my first little bass guitar, a little Japanese imitation Paul McCartney bass. Oh. And that started it. So I played in the same little band of guys all the way through high school. Who influenced you musically? Everybody, because I had the benefit of, you know, the Beatles came out when I was 10, and that was it for me, you know. But, uh, you know, in the radio, and so that would have been 1963, so, uh, 64. But the radio, it was AM radio at that time. Right. And AM radio was just like wide open, and it was full of, you know, Motown was exploding, Stax Records was exploding, the Beatles, the British Invasion. I mean, it was just the best time in the world. Soul music was exploding. I remember buying Knock on Wood by Eddie Floyd, which I believe was a Stax record, and sitting and trying to learn how to play the bass part to that song, which was quite an accomplishment for a beginner. But I just kept putting the 45 on and playing along really terribly but I finally kind of got that song and then that's how I just did it with 
you know, the bands we were in. We just played the music that we heard on the radio. The top 40 bands, dance bands, you were... Yeah. That's what you were yeah. accomplishing back then. Yeah. We played, but they used to call them sock hops. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know why. Yeah. <laughs> I think that was from the 50s. Yeah. Because you would go to the gymnasium of your school and play on the basketball court, and you had to take your shoes off, so that's how they got the name. Oh, I didn't know that. That's how they got the name Sock Hops, yeah. Wow. It seems like so long ago. It was 50 years ago almost. Yeah, when, when you start looking at it that way, let's not go down that road. That's all right. Yeah. I'm proud of it. When you got out of school, did you have an idea or an inkling that you wanted to be in music full time at that point? I really did. And my parents had been so supportive up to when I became a senior, you know, at, at the end of my senior year. When it was time to go, to go to college, you know, we were a lower middle class family. Both of my parents worked. My mom was a nurse. My dad worked for a trucking company. He started out as a truck driver. And then he went and got his accounting de degree at Cleveland University. So he was now an administrative part of the trucking business worked for the same company his entire life but anyways but they were so supportive like my mom would make us costumes for our band and my dad built us lights and he'd we'd load up our station wagon and he'd drive us around to gigs so it was very sweet but but at the end of my senior year we, you know he had the talk with me which was okay what are you going to do now like completely dismissed what I had been doing all this time, only because I think of his fear for me as a parent of the music business, because he didn't really know anything about it. And I think that he sensed that I was a very sensitive person, which I was and still am. And um, he just had a lot of fear about, you know, me being chewed up and spit out by the world, so to speak. And I'm sorry to say that he didn't recognize that that I had really did had a talent and I, you know, but so I went to I went to college for half of a year and college for me was like high school without passes. You know, I always joke that I got <clears throat> GPA concern, con, uh, confused with with THC, <laughs> <laughs> which I surely I surely did. And our family had moved in my senior year from Louisville, Kentucky to Evansville, Indiana. But it only took me about two months to join a band in Evansville. I'm all through my senior year of high school and my freshman year of college, I played in a band there in Evansville. But then after I flunked out of college, I kept in touch with all my bandmates from, from Louisville that I'd played all through high school with. And I ended up moving back to Louisville, working in a car wash, playing with these guys just locally in Louisville. And I met Sam Bush from The Revival. Coincidentally, the truth is, the first time I met him, I sold him a quarter pound of marijuana. <laughs> <laughs> and then, um. then when he called me to, for, then he got a, my phone number from a mutual musician friend in Louisville and called me on the phone from down where he lived around Bowling Green, Kentucky. And he said, Yeah, we got your number from this friend of ours, Ken Smith. And I was like, Oh, I, yeah, I know Ken. And he said, Well, we have this band. It's a bluegrass band. And we've made one record. And Anybody that could actually make a record at that point was like already way ahead of the game, in my opinion. They said, would you come down and audition? Because I was in Louisville up north, and they lived down in central western Kentucky. And I drove down there with a friend of mine and auditioned. They hired me on the spot. So that really started my professional journey because I had just turned 22, and I joined the band, and we went on the road, and station wagon and a some kind of Ford that Sam was driving, and that took me all the way to today. I mean, I was right off the bat started traveling, playing music. Was it something you'd love doing? Oh, yeah. And we didn't have any money, but it, I, we didn't really have any bills. Uh, I had a car that, that my parents paid off for me, and I didn't even have to pay rent. I lived with Courtney Johnson and his wife, the banjo player, in their little, barely a house. <laughs> it didn't have any, it had wood heat. So in the wintertime, I would sleep in the attic on the floor on a mattress. And it would be so cold because, the, at, you know, when it was time to go to bed, you quit putting wood in the wood stove. So uh, I would put 
all my winter clothes on, plus the heaviest coat I own, and I'd get a toboggan and I'd put it all the way over my face to where the all you the only thing was exposed was my nose and my mouth. So you could breathe. And that's how I slept. Yeah. <laughs> and it was awesome. I was having the time of my life. With the band Newgrass Revival, was there a certain point where you guys got together and you're out on the road and you're performing and all of a sudden it hit and you went, yeah, this is this is going to be something. Was there kind of that aha moment or did it take a while to get there? It really didn't because those guys were so good on their instruments, especially Sam. He was a phenom, a child phenom. You know, he when he was a teenager, he'd gone out and and uh, competed in the Weezer, Idaho fiddle contest, which is still going on. It's a legendary bastion for fiddle players playing contest music. And so he'd done that when he was 14 or 15. I was a really good rock and roll bass player, and I sang. And they'd never really had a real bassist in the band. So really, to be honest, I knew the first couple notes or the first couple hours that we played together, we were all like, this is really great. I mean, they were excited, and I was excited. And How was that transition, you know? This, it, was, it was kind of difficult. Yeah, because being I, a rock and roll player. I'd never not, and the last band that I'd played in in Louisville was a big dance band, and it, it, I was the, we had horns, and we had an African-American singer um, named Walter Webb, who was kind of a uh, Al Green Very knockoff, nice. yeah. so to speak. Really good singer, and a great entertainer, older guy. You know, I was like 21 years old. Uh, so, but to go from that to sitting in a room with a mandolin player, a guitar player, and a banjo player it was like, but they knew that I could really play. In fact, they told me later that they were in the kitchen, you know, rolling joints and, and making coffee. And I was in the other room. I just opened up my case, put the guitar on, put my bass on, and started playing around and tuning. And uh, they told me later that they were all in the next room in the kitchen pinching each other going, this guy can really play. Wow. So they were really excited. And I was too. I was in a band that had made a record. And But to go back to your question, no, I didn't know anything about that kind of music. I had heard, What I had heard was I had bought the first Will the Circle Be Unbroken album that the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band put out. And it had Doc Watson and Norman Blake and John, and you know... Um, Jimmy Martin and uh, Maybell Carter, and it was a great record. So that was really my first, in my ears, experience of listening to bluegrass, even though I'd grown up in Kentucky, which is strange. Yeah, I was going to say, because bluegrass and Kentucky go hand in hand. I was just part of a different culture. I was a young teenage guy playing in a rock and roll garage band. So When you heard bluegrass for the first time, Mm -hmm. was it kind of a... I don't know if epiphany is the word, but was it one of those like, yeah, this is kind of cool, or was it something you had to grow into? Oh, I thought it was cool. I was so enamored with playing with these guys because it was so different than anything I'd ever done, you know. In rock or R&B music, when you're the bass player, your your real connection was is with the drummer, you know, and you're kind of the foundation of which everything else is built upon. And But the thing about that I will still contend to this day about bluegrass. People that make money playing bluegrass are like superb musicians. It's like jazz. If you can't, because it takes so long to learn how to play correctly those instruments, the banjo and the fiddle and the dobro and the mandolin. I mean, if you can make a living playing bluegrass, you're already kind of a master musician, in my opinion, because it's hard. The music is really hard. It's not quite so hard for the bass player. Other than just timing, your timing has to be because you don't typically have a drummer in bluegrass. No, you never have. I mean, you 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 no, you, you don't really have a drummer. But so I you mean, really are kind of the beat of the band. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And then the mandolin is the drum, and I'm the luckiest guy in the world because Sam Bush is has to, anybody from the last fifty years. You ask me who has the best chop in bluegrass. Everybody to a person will say Sam Bush. So I mean, I lucked out. I mean. I don't know what it would have been like if I joined a band like that to where they weren't the level of musicians that these guys were. Right. So it was a perfect fit. We're going to take a break, get a word in for one of our sponsors, and when we come back, we're going to have some more conversation with John Cowan here in the studio. Hi, this is Miles Copeland, and you're listening to The Business Side of Music. You're listening to The Business Side of Music. 
Hi, everyone. I'm Larry Butler, and I want to send you a free digital copy of my new book, The Singer-Songwriter Rulebook, 101 Ways to Help You Improve Your Chances of Success. That's right. Everything you need to know to launch your career as a singer-songwriter, all based on my 40 years in the live performance arena. And believe me, I've seen it all. In my book, you'll find the 10 things you have to deal with before even thinking about becoming a singer-songwriter-performer. You'll also learn about the five things every singer-songwriter can do this weekend to make their live show better. Five things I can guarantee that you are not doing already. Plus, there's tips on songwriting and staging, photo and video shoots, publishing, merch, dozens of other topics, all written for people who don't particularly like to read. And again, it's free. Just go to the Business Side of Music website homepage and look for my book cover. Click on it, and a free digital copy of my book will be yours. I'm Larry Butler, and I approve of this message. What does it take to succeed in country music? Hi, this is Candy O'Terry, your host for Country Music Success Stories. And this is J.C. Don Valeris, your Music City mentor. Our Nashville-based podcast takes you into the homes and onto the back porches of country music icons. And the stories they tell us just might inspire you to make your country music success story come true. Check out Country Music Success Stories on your favorite podcast platform and subscribe today. You're listening to the business side of music. You think that you want to keep you so hollow inside and blinded to the love you've already got. Well, that's the story of my life. Out here in the sun, out here in the wind, there's no place to hide from the hurt. You walk without knowing where it will end. You learn what each moment is worth And it's my time in the desert Back in the studio, John Cowan is with us today. Bluegrass Revival, we've been talking about guys like Sam Bush. You've got Curtis Birch and, of course, then later Bella Fleck. And I remember Bella from Bella Fleck and the Flecktones. And to me, that was kind of jazz for me back in those days when I was learning improvisational, if I'm saying that correctly. Did Bella migrate to Newgrass or did Newgrass migrate to Bella or how did how did that come about? Well, in 1978, Curtis and Courtney and Sam and I, which is the Newgrass Revival, we joined Leon Russell. We were his band. He also brought in two Nigerian percussion players, but it was we were it was the four of us, Leon on the piano and two playing percussion. Leon's music. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. What was that journey like? It was amazing. It was just just mind boggling. The only real job I ever had was uh, right after my senior year of high school. I worked in a boat trailer factory in in Evansville. And almost all day long, the, because I worked on I worked on an assembly line, and the only way to keep myself, my brain occupied, because I was doing the same thing all day long, eight hours. So I would just be singing. I'd sing out loud because it was really noisy in there. I would sing to the top of my lungs, and I would sing Stevie Wonder songs and Leon Russell songs. And so Leon was one of my heroes. I mean, I would stare at the album covers and listen to all those records and just think, this is the greatest thing I've ever heard. You know, it was a Pentecostal piano and with a rock and roll band and three, four singers. And, and he was such an amazing songwriter and an unbelievable piano player. So he was already my hero. And here I am five years later in his band. It's like, what? You know, anyways, I think I digressed from what your original question was i think it was something about bella but yeah I, we we're talking about you know because bella was oh i know what i was going to tell you so what happened yeah. was the last year we were with leon which was 1981 right at the beginning of 81 courtney our banjoist courtney johnson and curtis birch the dobro and guitar player in newgrass revival decided that they were going to pull a power play and demand that we come off the road with leon because i guarantee that we spent those three years 
somewhere close to 270 days of road on the, on road. the road. Yeah. Almost, you know, close to a year. And they were tired of it. And the other thing was that as the tour went on and on and on, Leon would get really antsy. And so it started out, we'd play 30 minutes and then we'd come back and join him for 90 minutes. Well, after the second year, he was like, I'm going to cut you boys show down to about 20 minutes and then I'll come out. Well, then the last year we were there, he was like, I tell you what, um, we'll just play a couple of your, y'all songs in my show. And I was fine with it. But Curtis and Courtney, besides just working ourselves to death, they were kind of like, we have to stop working with Leon. So they came to Sam and I and said, if we don't quit Leon, we're quitting the band. Oh, my gosh. So Sam and I talked about it, and basically what happened was we said, well, okay, well, sorry. So Sam and I stayed the last year, 1981, just the two of us. The other two guys quit. And then we finally decided that it's time to, we need to be Newgrass Revival again. So we went after Bela Fleck. We knew he was the new guy. He was only 26 or something at the time, 25, I don't know. We were a little older. I'm, I think I'm... Sam and I are, Sam's a year older than I. I think we're both five or six years older than Bela. But he was the new guy. Yeah. I think they call it, uh, in French, l'enfant terrible. I don't know how to pronounce it, but he was the new phenomenon on the banjo. You know, he could play Earl Scruggs style till the cows came home, but he also worshipped Chick Corea, and so he was, he really loved jazz music. So what he was doing we felt like was going to fit us perfectly. So that's what happened. We asked him if he'd be interested in coming and sitting down with Sam and I playing. And he was living in Lexington at the time. He came down to Nashville where we had just moved, um, Sam and I, and auditioned for us. And that's how we, and we ended up all agreeing that this was something that all three of us wanted to do. How long did that that, that lasted for eight, eight years. Eight years. Because our last date we played as the Newgrass Revival with Sam and Pat and Bela was New Year's Eve 1989-90. We opened for the Grateful Dead. So. And then after that, you went out on your own. I did. I pursued a solo rock and roll career. How did that work out? Well, it didn't really work out. I mean, I got a record deal with Atlantic but it was the timing was pretty terrible because the music my, the music I was doing was really kind of like it was kind of like bad company like really great kind of R and B ish singing over crunchy guitars and you know I would say it was it was like Aerosmith or uh, bad company. But what happened was grunge came in that year, and it just that was the new thing. And I was already 37 by that time. Was this the John Cowan band at it that point? It was just point? called John Cowan. Did Atlantic understand what you were trying to do, or were you still trying to figure out what it was? I think or? I really knew. Yeah. I mean, I, I did. Know, I, I knew because we wrote music, and but I'd never been a solo artist before. I'd been in a band since I was 14, and now I'm 37 and trying to figure this out. It didn't really do anything. Uh, I got ended up getting dropped by the rec label. I didn't even make a record. So I went back and played in Sam Bush's band for a while, and then this crazy opportunity, which is the Sky Kings, came up through my friend Bill Lloyd, who was in Foster and Lloyd. Well, yeah, with Radney Foster. Yeah. Right. And so Josh Leo, who was the head of A&R, maybe the vice pres president of RC at that time, RCA, the Traveling Wilburys had come out, and Josh had this idea of, why don't we put together like a kind of a super group of people like that only in country music? And so, and you didn't start out as the Sky Kings. You, you that was had called Four Wheel Drive. Yeah. So the band initially was Bill Lloyd on guitar and vocals, Rusty Young from Poco on pedal steel and guitar and vocals. They asked Pat Simmons from the Doobies if he wanted to be a part of it, and the Doobies weren't doing anything at that point. And he said absolutely. Well, they asked Randy Miser from the Eagles to do it, and he committed to doing it. And then I don't know what happened, but at the last moment, he bailed on them. And Bill called me and um, asked me if I was interested. And I was like, absolutely. So I went somewhere here locally, maybe SIR or something, and played with Pat and Rusty and Bill. And everybody was like, oh, this is great. Let's do this. So, And that band was called Four Wheel Drive. And we did that. We made a record for RCA. Really good record. 
But then there was a regime change at RCA. Josh got fired. They brought in Tom Schuyler, I think. I can't remember. I think it was Tom Schuyler. Um, so what? this is what happens at, in for bands or for people a lot of times. When a new regime comes in, they look at everything that's already been signed, the label, and if it's something that's new that hasn't even come out yet, if it's not something they're interested in, they just they just let you go. So they let us go. But you had all these completed bodies of work as a band. We had a, a whole record, yeah. yeah. And you had one single that went out. Well, that came out later. See, after that, after we got dropped by RCA, our manager, Ken Levitan at the time, looked around town and had a meeting with Jim Ed Norman, who was the head of our, our Warner Brothers. Warner Brothers, yeah. So then we went into a record deal with Warner Brothers. And that took a year just for us to, you know, we'd go into the studio, we'd write songs, we'd take them to Jim Ed, and he'd say, yeah, that one's good, and these two aren't so great. And so that went on for about a year. In the meantime, the Doobie Brothers got reactivated because they got some offers to play. So Pat Simmons and Tom Johnston and John McPhee and anyways, the, they, they didn't have a bass player. So Pat said to the other guys, I'm in this band with this guy. He's really a good, great singer and a great bass player. What do you think about him coming out and playing with us? And I was like, and they were like, okay, if you say so. They just took his word for it. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how I got involved with the Doobie Brothers. But what ended up happening over that year period of us, the, us being the Doobie Brothers going back on the road, it kind of diverted Pat and Mai's attention from four-wheel drive. And at one point, uh, Jim Ed, and this is completely appropriate to do, he just, he sat Pat down. With, he, we all went to a meeting with Jim Ed, and, and Jim Ed said, look, Pat, you know, you're going to either have to do the Doobies or this band. We, I mean, you're, just, you're not going to have enough time and attention to do both. You know, Pat is the one guy that's been in the Doobies forever. Right. He's the one that's held it together through every change. He was always there. And he just said, you know, Jim Ed, I appreciate that. And I hate that you're making me choose between these two because I love both things with all my heart. But, wow. But I guess I'm going to have to s stick with what I know. So he went back to the Doobies. And I left the Doobies so I could pursue the Sky. And so, that's, so Bill and Rusty and I kept going with Warner Brothers. And we did make a single and put out an album. I think, the, yeah, no, the album never came out. Hmm. We're going to take another break, get another word in for another one of our sponsors. We'll come back. We're going to have some more conversation here with John Cowan. Hey, folks, this is Marlon with the band Exile. And, uh, you know, I'm sitting here with my pal Bob Bender sharing my expertise and wisdom, such as it is, here on the business side of music. Stay tuned. You're listening to the business side of music. Whether you consider yourself a musician or not, music is all around us and it affects our everyday lives. Whether it's background music influencing our shopping habits in a store, organ music adding the vibe to a baseball game, or a playlist convincing us to keep going on that last mile of a run. I'm Mindy Peterson, host of the podcast Enhanced Life with Music, where we take a holistic look at music's benefits through the lens of science and medicine, entertainment, and business. You can find me and Enhanced Life with Music at mpetersonmusic.com slash podcast or wherever you get your audio. You're listening to the business side of music. Lord, it seems I've been so many places, but at least I know I've got a long view. There's nothing that I've seen on strangers' faces that looks as good as coming home to you. Now don't tell me now, darling, that you're leaving. Not when it's not time for that, I know. Well, you feel like there is nothing to believe in. But give me one more chance before you go. On this long road back to you. Long road back to you. 
Back in the studio, John Cowan is with us. Your time with the Doobie Brothers, you you've you actually exited the Doobies mm-hmm. and then you came back. I did. You've done some solo projects. We talked about the rock project, but you have some other projects out there now. Was this during that? time that you weren't in the the doobies how how's the solo career kind of wrapped around the doobie brothers just it's all just been by accident to be perfectly honest um so i left the doobies pat stayed they got a different bass player they went on for 17 years and in that 17 year period i just pursued a solo career i made how many records five six seven a couple on sugar hill different labels and just playing on the periphery of the bluegrass world which i've always done right as the john cowan band and that that band has had a lot of different members over the years so in 2010 the gentleman who took my place in the doobie brothers had a massive stroke and they thought initially he was gonna nobody knew much at the time when he but they were in the middle of a tour and and he went to the hospital where he lived in las vegas really amazing musician and person his name is skylark So they just called me in a panic and said, look, Skylark just had a terrible stroke and we got all these dates. Can you come out and play? And I was like, okay, sure. And I thought it was going to, we all, they were like, well, it'd probably just be a couple of weeks. And here, now I'm 12 years later, I'm still here. (laughs) Wow. What's, what's that like to, and and I'm a huge Doobie Brothers fan going all the way back Mm -hmm. to Captain and me. Uh, what is that like to get on stage and to perform with those guys? Well, I'd already done it, you know, in the early 90s. Yeah. But the first time I did it in like 91, I think it was, is, yeah, it was staggering because... Now, was McDonald with him at that point? No. Michael McDonald? No, okay. he was not. It's staggering because like this, what's happened to me so many times in my career is... I'll be a huge fan. It's like I used to buy I, the first record I bought was Toulouse Street that had Listen to Music on it. And I was a fan. I'd, you know, I'd sit there and smoke joints and look at the album covers and read who played what. And, you know, a typical music fan. And then, you know, 20 years later, I'm on stage with them playing those songs. It's like, don't what? You know, this happened to me a million times. Yeah. I mean, I, all the people who's. I was fans of, of that I wound up working with Delbert McClinton, Emmy Lou Harris, Roseanne Cash, Rodney Crowell. I could go on and on, you know. On your solo projects, is there a particular favorite one that sticks out more than the others? Have they all been a, a growing process for you? Yeah, they have been. And I'm a I'm kind of a I'm a product of of my history and, you know, back from the beginning in other words so like i've never made just a bluegrass album like all my solo albums but i've always had banjo players in my band because it's what i it's it's kind of what i learned in newgrass which is that was such a weird deal you know it was a bluegrass band and i'm an r&b and rock and roll singer that is quite the transition well but it's what made that band work yeah you know because sam bush grew up the same time I did, he loved the Grateful Dead and he loved Jimi Hendrix and he loved Eric Clapton and he loved the Jefferson Airplane. And so we all brought our own previous pedigrees into that band. But that continued for me as a solo artist. Like, I just have so many interests musically, whether it's R&B or blues or jazz or reggae or whatever, you know, or bluegrass or folk music. That I, I, I don't ever, and I've been criticized, I think I've been maybe not criticized, but people maybe scratch their head. I've heard a million times of like, well, your records are just all over the place. It goes from an R&B song to a bluegrass song, but, but that's, what I, that's who I am. Nothing wrong with that, though. I don't think so. Yeah, I don't think so either. Is there one particular artist, we've talked about a lot of them, but is there one particular artist that you just really would love to work with that maybe you haven't had the opportunity yet? Oh, there's like millions and most of them are dead. <laughs> <laughs> Let's try and pick one that's living. Is there one that, that comes to your mind? Oh, I don't know. Stevie Wonder. Yeah. That's the, fir- that's the first one that comes to mind because I've been, you know, singing his songs and worshiping him as an artist since I was 13, maybe 12. Maybe eleven or ten when I, the first time I heard fingertips fingertips part one, I mean he was only like eight or nine when I'm older than him, but so I, I mean that came out in like 
63, 62, I don't know. Yeah. So I've been listening to him since, you know. Well, he's put a few albums out, that's for sure. Yeah. What are you working on now? I am working on a record with my dear friend Andrea Zahn, and it's being produced by Wendy Waldman, who produced the last New Grass Revival album and is a singer-songwriter of Beyond Compare and a great producer. And my friend Andrea is an amazing singer and an amazing fiddle player. She's played with Vince Gill and Lyle Lovett, but she spent the last 18 years with James Taylor. Oh, my goodness. So the two of us are making a crazy record together. What's that going to be about? What's, what's the, the it's style It's about great of that? singers singing great songs with great musicians. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. How can people find you? Me personally? Yeah. Well, I, my Facebook page is called John Cowan Music, uh, and I have a website, www.johncowan.com, C-O-W-A-N. That's about it. If you had one piece of advice you could give someone who was young, a younger you, you know, back in the 20s, who wanted to get into this business, because it's totally different now than mm -hmm. when you and I first got into it, what would that, that little piece of advice be that you would hand someone? The same thing is still applies regardless of what shape music business is in. Pedigree, in, in my opinion, is the most important thing. You have to learn from the masters. You have to copy them. You have to listen to them because ultimately that will, that will help you forge who you are as a, as a musician. Yeah. And actually, I did what I would advise somebody else to do. If you feel like this is really important to you and it's what you really want to do, do it. There's no guarantees and there never was for me. And my parents, you know, my dad wasn't even speaking to me. I mean, he died when I was 21. Um, we weren't even speaking because he was really angry that, you know, that I flunked out of college and that I wouldn't take his advice and get a real job, that I decided I was going to be a musician no matter what. Yeah. So I did what I would advise somebody else to do, which is if you think this is something real and you feel like in your heart this is who you are and what you want to do, do it. Do it. I mean, especially when you're a teenager. Even in, into your third, I mean, you could change your life at any time. If, if by the time, I've known people that have gone, if I don't make it by the time I'm 30, then I'm going to get a real job. And some people have to do that. Yeah. I've just been fortunate. Thank you so much. You're welcome. The Business Side of Music is the creation of Tom Sabella and Tracy Snow and is produced by Bob Bender. The Business Side of Music is recorded at Music Dog Studios in Nashville, Tennessee. Production sound designed by Keith Stark. Voiceover and promo by Lisa Busan.
And I feel like going home Cloudy skies are closing in And not afraid I'm so tired 